Um, this is not a challenge. It should not be thought of as a challenge in any way. There is going to be a demonstration by a psychic, a self proclaimed psychic today, and I will ask that we sort of treat it with the same respect we treated the challenge last year. Uh, and it's really sort of an exercise in finding out how do, you know, it's not so simple when people actually just come to you and say, hey, I want to be tested. There's a lot that goes into it. But we're going to get to that because there's a lot of misconceptions about the challenge. And a lot of people, I've heard different stories about the history of the challenge. And I think it would be exciting for us to learn how the challenge started, how it happened before even uh, the JREF got involved. And there's only one person that's been around through all of this. So to do this, I'm going to bring up my, what I consider sort of a father figure to me, because, uh, well, long story on that, but somebody I love dearly and have loved dearly for many, many years, James Brandon. Ladies and gentlemen, it, it may just be a paranormal event because James Randy appears to have just vanished. Yes, he does, and that's the very first part. Yes, he had a dinner he had to go to. Nobody told me. Yes, I should have known this. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so maybe uh, if you want to discuss uh, some of the uh, details of the current state of the challenge, the current state of yeah. the challenge with Allison. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the next step. And if Randy happens to come back, if somebody, then when is he going to be back from dinner? Do we know? Thursday. Anybody <laughs> know? Could you find that out for me? Because there's a lot of important questions that were in that segment. Hi, John. <laughs> All right, so under the brain, Allison Smith up here, ladies and gentlemen. I think you all know Allison. Let's hear it for Allison. I know she's here. Yeah. All right, so we're going to move forward just a little bit. You can sit next to me if you want to. You don't have to if you don't want to. I am not doing mentalism stuff on you. So I have a lot of questions for you because you've been involved in the challenge for approximately the last three years. You've been involved in JRAM for the last three years. So you've dealt with many of the people that have come and said, hey, I want to uh, I want to take the challenge. And it's not quite as simple as people think it is. And I know you talked to a lot of people about that. So I've got a few questions that I do want to ask you. Um, and uh, how long have you been involved in the challenge? I know I mentioned a little bit myself, but I could be wrong on that. And what are your responsibilities when it comes to the challenge? I started as an intern with the JRF about three years ago. And it was just so interesting to me to see the challenge application. When I first started, I wasn't building challenge protocols or anything like that. I was going through the files, seeing where each person was in their negotiations, and working out some of the details with them. But it became so interesting to me, I wanted to get more involved. So when I got hired on as an actual employee with the JREF, I sort of adopted the challenge and made it so it was my thing, and I got to negotiate protocols. And it was so cool, because I'd read about the challenge so many places since I was 10. And being a part of it has just been great. Good. Let's talk a little bit about some of the, the out-of-country claims, because sometimes there are claimants that sort of get in that little lingo there, where, where, where they're hanging all the time. Can we touch upon that a little bit? Just come up in conversations with people. Sure. Um, most of the challenge applications that we receive don't actually come from the United States. The vast majority come from out-of-country. And that's difficult because many areas don't have skeptical groups and the individual can't afford to fly here, and it becomes very difficult to test them. One person we've had a problem with that in that regard is Karina Landon, who is in Sweden. She applied, I think, four years ago at this point. She was tested once by the Swedish skeptics, but there was a problem with her protocol. Someone said should when they meant must, and we offered to retest her on the basis of that. And we haven't been able to find anyone to actually take that test yet to be the tester for her. And she can't afford to fly here, so she's just kind of hanging out, waiting. And that happens relatively often. There's another one, Natalia Brodnikova, who is located in Russia. She's a relatively recent claimant. And we don't have anyone in her area who can do her test either. The problem with hers is that there are so many minute details. She claims to be able to do biolocation. She can tell which room in a corridor a person is in with her biolocator sense. And when you get into the really fine details of her protocol, it's going to be like, do the floors in the place creak? Because if they creak, we need to do something about this. But 
to send it to another tester would be like 20 pages worth of protocol, all of these little tiny things, and it's just not feasible. Right, so is that a problem with the USA? I mean, as we've talked about overseas people, is that a problem with people in the USA trying to get to a location? Not so much. I don't actually ever see that because we have so many great skeptical friends located all over the country who are willing to help us. One of the great things about the JRF is how well known we are for this challenge. People are really excited to be a part of it. We aren't actually officially affiliated with any groups to where they can run the challenge under our name and our banner or whatever, but we do contact individuals and ask them if they would be interested in testing for us. Yeah. Now we've talked back and forth, and you came up with a great idea. Now I do want to I do want to stress on this that and we're discussing a lot of things right now. So there's a lot of things in the works and there's some things we can and can do, some things we would love to do, but we can't necessarily always follow through um, for various reasons. But you came up with a really quite a clever idea of um, claimants that are out of the country, you know, and, and but, but as a current world stand, we can't we can't do that. Half changes would have to be made. Do um, you want to talk about that a little bit? You know what I'm talking about? Sure, yes. I suggested that we hold live challenges for all the claimants who can't afford to fly to the United States, where we'll go to them and we'll test them, but with the stipulation that they have to do it live in front of an audience, and then we can just open the challenge test to the public, charge a small amount of money, and it will pay for all of our airfare and all of the costs of setting up the test. And if the claimant agreed to that, it would be a great publicity tool for the JREV and the challenge and would also allow us to test these people that otherwise will just be sitting for years waiting for their test. Yeah, well, this is a perfect example. With face value, it sounds fantastic. But then we have to find ways to be fair to everybody that wants to take the challenge. So, so there are all these other issues that come up. So again, you know, fantastic ideas. We've just got to find a way to implement them. Um, it's fair to everybody, to all claimants. Uh, and, and, and there may be ways to do that. So we're still working on that one. Um, here's a sensitive issue. up a lot and it's, it's people say it to us all the time and it's about the mentally ill issue that comes into play with this type of phenomenon. Whenever you examine this type of phenomenon, you do attract a certain amount of people that are, are mentally unstable, yes? That's true, but the only way that I know that is because they tell me so. Um, people will tell me that they're under the care of a psychiatrist, otherwise I have no idea. I'm not a mental health professional and I don't feel safe in judging anyone else and saying that they are insane or I mean, if you're a skeptic and you come from the viewpoint that the evidence points to there being no paranormal activity in this world whatsoever, then everyone who believes that there is is insane. Where do you draw the line and why is it my responsibility to do that? It's a challenge that's open to anyone who fits our criteria and if we start trying to implement these other rules, it's just going to make it so we are in constant negotiations with the claimant. And I don't think that it's exploitation of the mentally ill. Because again, I can't say that they are mentally ill.